Welcome to our second webinar on the annotation of literary and documentary texts through the main specific languages. The series of webinars is organized by the Coffee Lab, which is the laboratory for collaborative and cooperative philology of the Institute for Computational Linguistics, Antonio Zampoli, Seminario Pisa, the LAMA, which is the laboratory for the anthropology of the ancient world, University of Pisa, Clarinet, and the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities of the DSU of Kafoska University, which hosts our webinars on its web platform and publishes the edited videos on a dedicated channel of YouTube. Indeed, I remind you that our webinars are recorded. Euporia is a Greek word that means ease, facility of doing thing, because we aim at discussing best practices for annotation, not only with digital philologists, but with an enlarged community of scholars with many specific research questions and the need to share data and tools by approaching standards without losing the focus on their disciplines. It is a great pleasure for Andrea Tadei, Franz Fischer and me to introduce our speakers to the audience of this webinar series. Daniele Fusi is a research grant holder in digital textual scholarship at Venice DPH Center, designer and developer of the well-known Cadmus annotation system. And Daniel Kiss is visiting scholar at Venice DPH Center, designer and developer of the well-known Catullus online project. Last week, with Luigi Bambaci, PhD student in Jewish studies at the University of Bologna, we discussed the treatment of porcelain printed or bone digital well structured critical apparatus. This week, our speakers will illustrate challenges and solutions in the treatment of complex semi structured critical apparatus. So uh, now the first speaker is, uh, is uh, Daniel. Uh, thank you. I I let I will begin immediately, and I'll share my screen. Let's see that this goes well. Yes, you can see you can see my slide. Yeah. All right. So, um, encoding a critical apparatus: the cases of Musisque Deuque and Catullus Online. Um, with Daniela Fusi, we are working on an a wholesale restructuring of two legacy um, digital critical editions of classical Latin literature. And we would like to present you some of that work today. And I will talk more about the philological aspects of the, of the work and Daniele about the digital aspects, but the two are interrelated as you will see. So um, how do you edit an ancient text? There is a very simple conceptual model, which is this. You take the ancient sources, which are usually manuscripts, mostly from the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and the scholarship about the reconstruction of those texts, and you combine the two into an edition. And the edition is the text that you get. So you don't go from the text to the scholarship, but the, the other way around, the te text is the product. It's, it's a hypothesis. It's uh, not, not a, an initial piece of data. What you um, start out from is the data of the sources. So um, there might be an obvious initial argument to, to, the, to, to suggest that it's easy to digitalize uh, this whole process, because you start from data and human input and you end up at, with an end product. How does this work in practice? I will take here a, show here a very quick example. This is Catullus's manuscript O, or Oxoniensis, in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. You see the shelf marks on the slide. And um, I will read these two lines here in the manuscript. Non possum reticere de. Uh, it's heavily ab abbreviated uh, late medieval Latin, quam fallius ire invenit aut quantis viverit officis. So this is one of the three manuscripts of this passage that have source value, one of the three sources, and it reads this. Um, um, 
would like to go ahead with my slide. Here I am. Uh, and here you see the same Latin text written with modern typography. What does it mean? Um, goddesses, hoppa, sorry. Um, goddesses, die. I cannot keep quiet about how, and then here you get a no, non word in Latin, fallius. There is no such Latin word and no such Latin name. How fallius to go and he finds, or with how la large services we wear it. And we wear it is another Latin non word. It looks like a Latin word, but it is not. We are in lorem ipsum territory there. So um, the text is garbled. And you look at O's. Uh, close relative G, another uh, source text with source value of this manuscript. Um, and here, this passage is here. We'll go there. This is the San Germanensis in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And here, you, the second image, I hope you can see it clearly, is that of G. And it reads, uh, non possum reticere dei quam fallius, you still have fallius there, this nasty, uh, non-word, in re, the dash indicates that we should read an N, a letter N there. Um, so there is a, hoppa, um, there is a difference, a difference in this reading. In blue, you have the reading of O, and in red, the reading of G. And here, G reads, you were it, written like this in Latin with two U's, out quantis, you were it of fikis. So three words in G, are, are different in G, you see them in red, from in from the way they stand in O. Um, and this is a basic edition of the text from these two manuscripts and manuscript R, which is a brother, R Romanus, which is the brother of, of G. Um, and you see here what we call a critical apparatus. So um, for these two lines of poetry, um, it gives a brief summary of the readings, the, the text to be found on these sources. So here you find in re in the text, and in re is the, exactly the reading of R. I am the editor. I think in re is convincing. And uh, G writes in re in one go. That's not, not important. So... Um, for late medieval manuscripts, this is not a significant difference, and O has a different, uh, significantly different word, ire. And here in line 42, um, these two words are written in one way by G and R, and in another way by O. So data presented in a compact format, um, quite stylized, but very transparent if, if you are used to this kind of thing. But still, we have that nasty word fallus in, in um, line 41, and you can't make sense of this text. So we need help, and we get help from this man, uh, Joseph Scaliger, who was a brilliant uh, Calvinistic Protestant intellectual, a Frenchman, and a brilliant scholar, and uh, quite an unpleasant person uh, in his dealings with less intelligent human beings, but very, very good as a scholar. And he reconstructed the text um, by proposing what we call a conjecture. So he reconstructed instead of quam fallius in the manuscripts here, qua me allius. And now we get a text that actually makes sense. And it means goddesses, dei, I, uh, I cannot keep quiet, non possum reticere, about in what matter, in what matter, um, uh, qua in re, or in what's, with what services quantis officis alius has helped me. So uh, Scaliger's correction um, has introduced uh, a figure alius who actually appears elsewhere in this same poem and he has sorted out the grammar. So uh, a brilliant correction that solves the problem. And here you see the two kinds of um, basic information that appear in critical apparatuses of ancient texts, namely, information about what we find in our sources and information about what scholars such as Scaliger um, do with the text. This is pretty straightforward, um, but there are some challenges. So you see the basic, well, the, the basic uh, uh, way of separating readings is a, a colon, but here we have 
two readings that are separated by a comma because they are more closely related to each other. Um, so if you if you want to uh, write a computer program to analyze analyze uh, um, critical apparatuses, then this fairly simple and trivial point that these I put these readings here together because they are very closely related. They are different but related, and they are only separated by a comma. Um, this might cause the program to stumble, but it's a matter of presentation of cosmetics, if you like. <clears throat> there are some other challenges of form. So here I take from Catullus Online, which as you see, I <laughs> edited myself um, and always from the text of Catullus, some challenges. Um, this is a full note uh, on one Catullus 1.1 1 .1 line one. Um, no, I, sorry, it should be point one line two. I, I mistake there. Um, Punike is the reading of manuscript R at this point, but this reading has been corrected in the manuscript itself by hand R2, so the second person writing in that manuscript. And cor means that corrects it in Latin, that this person has added the text reading, namely Punike. Um, but that is not included in the apparatus for brevity's sake. Um, and for, for other reasons. Um, that's a um, problem of presentation. Another problem of presentation is when the name of an author is conjugated. So scariger is a nominative in Latin, but in some cases, so Latin is the standard language, um, uh, mei dentis et mei obtuentis is given by, here by Heinsius, that should be an I-U-S, teste brucusio by brucusius. Uh, and then the number, the year of his edition and the page number. Um, so if you write a soft, software to read um, a critical apparatus, then it will stumble over this conjugated, this, this um, sorry, this, uh, this, this inflected name because it's not the standard nominative form. Um, these are matters of presentation, but I think that the contents of a critical apparatus um, also presents some logical, some profound logical challenges, which might make it hard to encode. And we are, I think, in even more interesting territory here. So um, the first of these three passages is a quotation of a marginal note from a source manuscript. So hand R2, which actually has independent source value, um, it adds above this word, tepefakit, alias, Alter alternatively in medieval Latin, factat, but R2 means tepe factat. It, the, the man simply hasn't written the first part of this Latin word. Um, on the same passage, um, and here I quote uh, verbatim from the critical apparatus of Catullus Online, um, um, there is another reading, tepe fiant, um, and which is attributed um, to Fossius, another conjugated, uh, inflected name, um, Fossius in his commentary of 1684. Um, but I, I go, DK, Daniel Kish, uh, Reperire Nequivi. I have not been able to find this, this ancient manuscript. So this is a note about two, three, two people and a manuscript or a codex, Fossius and me. Um, Fossius quotes the reading from the manuscript from, from the codex. It might be a printed book with some marginal notes, actually, and I have not been able to find it. Um, does it exist? I don't know. Fossius was rather messy. Um, and then uh, another logical challenge, actually, this is pretty trivial, but of another order, is transposition when the transmitted order of the text is changed. Um, um, and you see here Catullus 58 B, B points two and three, two verses, which were exchanged. Um, they were um, placed in inverse order by Muretus, uh, Marc-Antoine Muret, uh, a French scholar also from the, from the 16th century, a great rival of Scaliger. So um, uh, this means, this indicates that you cannot treat the text as an authoritative, authoritative um, starting point, because um, if you automatically assume that the, the line numbers are correct, that verse three will follow verse two, then you you make it impossible for editors to, to replace, to exchange those two 
interchange those two lines to put line three before line two, which is actually what happened to me with Catullus online. Um, and this is a very good, uh, a very good suggestion by by Muretus. So so um, we should follow it there. Um, can we thus regard the rules that inform modern printed critical apparatuses as implicitly as a kind of a DSL? And there are some rules in arguments in favor of this, um, namely that the apparatus is a broad body of structured that data with a stylized formal structure. And there are re repetitive structuring elements with an identical function. We have seen those colons and the commas. And there is also stylized language. We have seen cor for correxit, uh, a term, Latin term that will appear in most modern critical apparatuses of classical Latin and Greek texts. But there are counter arguments as well. Um, one is that the meaning of some elements, such as commas and brackets, depends on the context, and human beings can understand the context, but an, a, a computer program will not normally do so. The other problem is that the relationship between those elements, especially readings, is not constant. Two readings might be related to each other or not related. Um, they might superimpose uh, with each other or they might not. And some data are actually qualified by comments. So I haven't brought an example of this, but a scholar might say um, that is a good reading, that is not a bad reading, or that's a fake or whatever. Or, well, you have seen my example about the, the manuscript quoted or the codex quoted by Fossius, which I have not been able to find. So it might be a phantom. So much about the theory. Um, we. Let's, let's move on to the two projects. Um, Musisque Deuque is a digital archive of Latin poetry created from 207 onwards um, under the leadership of Professor Paolo Mastandrea here at Kafoscar University. Um, and it's a digital archive of Latin poetry. It contains a huge amount of Latin poems from antiquity to I think early modern times. And many of those editions are digital. So here is their chronological index. They have several indices and you have the number of the name of authors. Here you find Catullus, uh, Lucretius, uh, Cicero's brother, Cicero Junior, uh, above Cicero Senior, Virgil, and all the rest. And um, here you can see the critical edition of Musis of Catullus, poem one in Musisque Deuque. And it's based on the edition of Eisenhut from 1983, which is uh, a, dated, a dated edition. It's not very good. So that's one of the reasons why I'm working for to create a new edition of Catullus for Musisque Deuque. And you also see that the critical apparatus is rather limited. So here you have four notes on words um, highlighted in blue and a little yellow label which indicates a note on the entire verse. Um, and here I show that you can visualize the note on line two Arida. Um, this is this is Catullus poem one, of course, but that's not a very dense critical apparatus. Just keep in mind um, how many or how few comments we have here. And all this has been encoded by hand by collaborators of the project. And then this is the second example, Catullus Online. Um, um, and the subtitle is an online repertory of conjectures on Catullus. And I made this myself between 2009 and 2013 when it went live. And um, this is a digital edition of the poems of Catullus, which are, which is actually, it's the opposite of Musisque Deuque, it's a closed and rather short body or limited body of text, well, not very short, but um, control, it's a, not, an, not an enormous amount, about 116 poems. You can argue about how many poems there are and about 2,300 verses. So this would be about 75, 80 printed pages in most books. And the critical apparatus, on the other hand, that accompanies these poems is extremely rich. So there are about 15,000 readings 
um, that's my estimate, and about 60,000 60, sources are quoted. That's again an estimate. I tracked all those sources sometime during my research. And the sources are four principal manuscripts, OGR and T, 120 other manuscripts, and over 900 items of bibliography. So it's very, very detailed. It has, um, the, it's, it follows the opposite of this light touch of Musée Square Daouk, where we have a, a, a limited amount of text that's subjected to intense study. What does this mean in practice? And here you see the Catullus, um, Catullus poem one, the first lines with critical apparatus. And this is the mode in which you can see all the, the full critical apparatus to Music Square, to Catullus online. And on the right of my slide, you see the amount of notes on every line that there is. There is a note on almost every single line of the Catul Catulan corpus and, and on many lines, there are very, very, very many notes. And let's see here. Um, so this is to frighten you. These are the notes just printed um, separately on the first, uh, I, I cut out um, an image of the, the notes on the first few poems of Catullus. So you see how, how dense um, this material is and often this, this, this formal structure is straightforward, but sometimes it is not straightforward at all. So I have come, reached the end of my part of the presentation and I'll pass the word to Daniele Fusi. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. And uh, now Daniel will illustrate the second part. Okay, can you see the, the slides? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to move a window. Okay. So, given the theoretical framework sketched by Daniel, I start with showing you the general work for workflow for projects uh, aiming to a more structured representation of critical editions. The legacy Catullus online site is fed by a database which derives from some Excel files created by Daniel, one with text and apparatus and another with bibliography. The legacy Musisco de Oco site is fed by another database which can export and import data in an idiosyncratic TI format using standoff notation for the apparatus. TI here is the exchange format to let it flow from the legacy system to my own, Cadmus, and vice versa. <clears throat> Cadmus is the import target also for Catullus Online. Anyway, that's a complex conversion, which implies adding more structure to a low structure text. And for the reason this happens via another system of mine designed for such conversions, this is Proteus, which can also handle other low structure sources, even documents got from OCR. So once in Cadmus, anyway, data is highly structured into a database and gets edited in a web user interface which allows making corrections, adding new materials, and so, so that we can then build a new Catullus based on a new database or a new Mosisco de Oque in the same way, or produce uh, TI with standoff apparatus, try calls for the semantic web, or whatever output uh, we prefer. So here, data, data architecture of Cadmus is the core, so let's have a quick look at it. Cadmus is a web-based open creation system for highly structured content. It's content-centric, allowing to create any data type or whatever its relationship with text. It focuses on data designed and stored independently from its storage technologies. And the content is a scheme agnostic. Data models are dynamic and modular, built by composition, and each model is independent and has its own editing user interface. As such, it's open and modular. New models can be added at any moment without affecting existing material. And finally, there is a shared infrastructure providing a centralized database, backup, uh, auditing, uh, graphical user interface, uh, web-based uh, concurrent editing, etc. 
So the data architecture too is open and modular. Essentially the base record is the item, an empty container, you can think of a box. Its model is just the sum of the, part it, of the parts it contains. And then parts are the objects we put in that box, each has its own model and editing user interface. And these parts can represent anything, including text or metatextual annotations. Metatextual parts in turn include a set of entries named fragments, and each is a specialized data model linked to the base text. Let's see a layer text example using an inscription. Here, metadata are distributed in several layers, each with its own model. So for instance, the text itself is a part. Then we have a prosopographic layer with it about the census, a paleographic layer describing the Crismon, a comment layer with a couple of fragments about uh, Impatien and Dannis, an orthographic layer with a standard orthography for Bixit, a chronology layer resolving the dates, and an abbreviation layer resolving the CAL abbreviation. We does end up uh, with one item, our inscription, and seven parts. One part is the text, and the other six parts are layers on top of it. In this context, the user editing experience uh, is very friendly, because for the text part, its model is an object with a plain text plus uh, an optional citation, so the user just has to free type the text. And once we have the text, uh, editing layers uh, is as simple as selecting any portion of it and clicking to add some metadata. A dedicated uh, user interface opens here for the apparatus, where you can edit uh, its model in, in its own uh, user interface. And uh, this same concept uh, uh, for the apparatus holds for any other part. So its model comes with its own independent uh, user interface. So how's the apparatus modeled for Catullus Online and Musisco de Open? I'd like first to emphasize the fact that while designing a Cadmus model, we are not constrained by requirements of any specific digital format. For instance, uh, we don't care about tags or their placement in the unique XML tree. Rather, we freely design an abstract object with some properties. And uh, also, this is just one of the possible models for the apparatus. We can design and plug in any other model we want. So here, the apparatus layer part is only a list of fragments, just like any other layer part. In turn, each fragment in it may be assigned to some taxonomy via tag and as a list of entries. Each entry can be a simple annotation relevant for text constitution or a variant. And the variant may be a replacement with some other value or zero for deletions or an insertion. And besides the value, we may also want to provide its normalized form. We also specify if this is the entry accepted by the editor and provide a list of witnesses and the voters, uh, ancient or modern, with the same structure. Finally, several entries uh, can be assigned to a specific taxonomy or be part of a more complex description of text variation via their group ID. So as an example, consider this verse. The word the cui is linked to a fragment in the apparatus layer part, and this fragment has two entries representing variants. Let's focus on the first one. The type is replaced with a value equal to cui and a corresponding normalized value. It's accepted by the editor and reported by three witnesses. And there are also three ancient sources for it. Now, that's a granular abstract model, not to be interpolated in the text as markup, but rather designed, stored, and edited independently in a database rather than in a file. Let's now see how we can get to the structured model from the Excel files of Catullus Online. The Excel files for text and apparatus appear like this, line by line. We have a column for the poem and the line ID, another for the text, another with the whole text of the apparatus with some typographic style. And uh, so you can see that uh, this text contains groups of entries connected to the same passage. Here I'm showing them with yellow, green, and blue. And inside them, each single entry is ended by a column. We just need to face the complex task of adding structure to this legacy source where apparatus is a free rich text just like in a paper edition, except that each cell includes all the entries related to the same verse. 
So we must uh, extract information from text and remodel it into parts, and each parts fragment must, must be linked to its base text. To this end, I'm using my Proteus conversion system created to remodel typographic formats, either standard or proprietary into semantic formats. And the system got a number of different real world applications ranging from dictionaries to legacy or paper, documental archives and critical editions. The idea uh, in Proteus is having a common processing model, whatever the source, and to this end, Proteus models any digital source as a list of atomic entries. And these entries are of three types. We have the text, but also properties, that is a commonly used formatting property with a single toggle value like italic or color. And command, that is any other more complex typographic or semantic uh, metadata like a paragraph end. So whatever the source format, a reader software component renders it into a flat list of such entries. So for instance, from the first uh, two words of this text, we have a, a command entry signaling the entry start, a text entry for CUI, a property entry for toggling italic, another text entry for OGR, etc. So the list of entries then flows through a pipeline, which gets built by assembling several components together. We start from a, an entries reader, which reads one entry at a time from any source format. Eventually, we can filter the entries read to better adapt them to the parsing process. And then we use region detectors to detect semantically defined regions in the text. Eventually, we can filter these regions. And finally, a region parser parses each region in a special way, building the target model we want to reach. So let's see an example, starting from some words of the apparatus. As you can see here, typographic style has been converted by the Excel parser into underscores. But for the rest, we just have a list of entries of the various types, like commands, text, and properties. Using a region detector injected into our pipeline, we can delimit the entries representing the lemma. The region detector here is a general purpose component based on a regular expression pattern, plus some other parameters you can see on the left. For instance, uh, here it detects uh, as lemma the text starting with a non-digit character and found just after the command at the beginning of the apparatus entry. The same detector with different parameters delimits the list of witnesses, which uh, here are O, G, and R. Here instead, a different detector, a fallback detector, delimits the useless connective text, uh, which can be just discarded by the, converted, the converter. And finally, here again, the pattern-based detector delimits a bibliographic reference to an ancient author. Now, here we have just seen a few entries, but uh, this should give you the idea of the region detection process across thousands of entries for the whole text. Using region detectors, so we are just finding boundaries in this list, and this will allow us to later process each region in its special way using parsers. So the infrastructure is always the same, but we can plug into the pipeline any specific module for any specific task. <clears throat> of course, that's a complex process. So at the end of the pipeline, we can plug a dump region parser, which instead of parsing the regions to build our target model, just dumps them into Excel files in this case. So this shows how the pipeline works. And here is a sample output. We have an apparatus entry with columns representing its text entries, property entries, command entries, and detected regions with their coordinates. For instance, Novum here was detected as lemma, OGR as witnesses, Pastrangicus as author, and so forth. Any region is listed in the last column with its name. Once we have detected our semantic regions in the list of entries, the region parsers kick in and build the desired model, in this case, the apparatus model. For instance, here the lemma novum provides the model with uh, its value and normalized value, and OGR represent three witnesses. 
the parser here outputs a JSON representation of the model, which then gets imported into the Cadmus database. We does enter the realm of highly structured data and can edit them inside Cadmus to be later output as we want. So in this uh, scenario, we are facing a very complex, uh, low structured legacy source, and we ourselves uh, do not know its details in advance. Rather, we are going to discover them while repeatedly executing this pipeline. And so this conversion is uh, a heuristic, uh, progressively refined process. And that's, of course, a challenging process, but the pipeline allows us to tackle one issue at a time, divide tempora. So let's see an example of this method. Let's consider bibliographic references and how they are detected. First, bibliography gets parsed from Excel into a set of structured records. Then a lookup component loads the parsed results. And finally, a region detector in the pipeline uses this lookup to find references captured across text entries. So for instance, here, Alice 1867 inside this text is correctly detected as a bibliographic reference region. Yet in this wilderness, things are not that easy. So for instance, uh, first of all, there is some inflection for Latin author names as we have seen. So here Statius appears in ablative, but the lookup component only knows about the nominative Statius. So the region detector fails. Second, in some cases, the death date happens to be interpolated in the reference. And when this happens, it produces a number of splits in the sequence of entries. And this is due to the fact that for aesthetic purposes, the brackets and the dagger are not italic. And so here, typography fights the semantics, even if it's a consequence of it. So how can we solve these issues in the pipeline? <clears throat> First of all, we insert an entry filter. This component is used to adapt entries to the general pattern we are already using for detecting bibliography because variation here is too complex and would otherwise disrupt our pattern. <clears throat> so a pattern-based entry filter is used to merge these entries into just a single one. And it looks for the specific pattern we empirically deduced from our dump and applies this merging. Once filtered, the bibliographic reference region detector will be able to spot the fruterius reference but this can only happen if the lookup component can handle date interpolation. So let's expand the capabilities of our lookup by adding a couple of new expander components, which are used to expand in different ways the entries got from the bibliography. As for inflection, the expander applies thematic singular inflection to all the names ending with us. And for death date and other corner cases I've not covered here, another expander integrates the lookup data got from parsing with any manual additions from a file. So here you can see the final configuration of the bibliography region detector with its source lookup data, manual integrations expander and inflection expander. And so uh, that's how we deal with complexity by injecting new modular components into our pipeline and repeating the conversion until we are satisfied with the results. Anyway, I'd like to conclude uh, with a few remarks on the potential for DSL applications in the context of this workflow. Because despite the wilderness, which excludes their direct application to this import process, there's a plenty of room for them. The first case is represented in Cadmus by quick editing support. I already have a number of components which make use of a sort of mini DSL to allow users enter data in two-way user interfaces. A visual method, which is easier for new buys, and a textual method, a method which is quicker. Users are free to toggle between two these two modes because changes in one are reflected in the other. But of course, a DSL only method can be implemented as well. So for instance, um, take datation, which, is a, which has a complex model represented by one or two points on a timeline. And uh, take this expression. Its first point has a year value of minus 367, spanning across two Gregorian years, and is dubious. 
Its second point has an approximate year value of 150 with a hint about its definition. And now look at this animation while I'm talking. Users can just type using a mini language designed to fully represent the datation model we have just seen or use a visual user interface and free toggle between the two input modes. Of course, uh, here the DSA the method is quicker, but it may be either easier or more difficult according to user preferences. So here I'm just leaving the choice to the user. Another short example for manuscript choirs. The choir model has several properties like start and end sheet in the manuscript, the sheets count, optional variations in the count, uh, whether the choir is the paradigmatic one or not, and free annotations. All these can be entered via a mini language representing the manuscript collation formula at the top of the editor or visually with the user interface controls. So here too, we can toggle between these two modes and have our model filled with data. So of course, these are just short samples, but we also have other usages for DSL. For instance, given our workflow, we could insert the DSL in the Proteus pipeline components where patterns can be distilled up to true DSL. In editing data, as we have just seen, or in exporting data where it will be easy to use a DSL to provide a reusable export mechanism starting from the highly structured data in the Cadmus database, but also in building Cadmus components themselves because uh, you have to remember that Cadmus is an open modular system. So we may want uh, to design and add new models for it at any time. And for both backend and frontend, this uh, usually happens by writing a few codes based on some templates. So here, a DSL could lower the code barrier and let scholars just design models in an easier way using some DSL, and then uh, get the text and uh, transform it into code using this language. So this way we can join the divergent Proteus path with DSL and happily end our journey here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel and Daniele. And uh, now if uh, uh, you have uh, any question, you can write uh, in the chat and uh, uh, and then to ask uh, whatever you want to Daniel and Daniele. So I have a first question for both, okay. Uh, that concern uh, the critical apparatus in the digital uh, uh, age, okay? Because uh, uh, in many cases, uh, the critical apparatus, okay, is uh, a little bit criticized, okay? Because uh, uh, it is uh, in a certain sense uh, subjective instead of being uh, objective, okay? I guess that uh, a critical apparatus uh, is uh, uh, in the middle, okay, between uh, a scientific work, okay, and a creative work, okay, because uh, a critical apparatus uh, is uh, a, how can I say, is, a, is an anthology, you know, is an anthology, is a selection of uh, uh, variants, uh, is a, a, of relevant information, is a selection of relevant information, okay? Uh, there are uh, many, or uh, in principle, they, it, it should contain all the variants, okay? But uh, according to certain criteria, okay? And just uh, a, a, an anthology of, uh, 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 conjectures, okay, because it isn't a, a repertory of conjectures uh, in which you have all the conjectures, okay, but you have uh, just uh, the most relevant conjectures, okay, that the editors uh, have created, okay. So in any case, uh, uh, a critical apparatus isn't just a collection, 
okay? Uh, it and it isn't uh, a paper, it isn't uh, a commentary, it's uh, is, uh, a specific work, okay? That is the critical process. So I would, I would know which is uh, your idea of the critical apparatus, okay, in the digital age, okay? So I mean, for example, somebody, okay, in a naive uh, um, vision could think that the digital apparatus can be created automatically, okay, by the automated collation, okay? We know that we cannot do that, okay, but uh, uh, so, what, what do you think of the role of the critical apparatus in the digital age? Um, well, uh, I, if I may take this question, um, actually, um, to, to start with your last uh, comment, um, what is the role of the critical apparatus? Well, it's developing, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that people such as Sam Husky and Michael Henry are here with us who have ha played an important role in developing uh, digital crit critical apparatuses. So, so um, digital critical editions are a work in progress. And I, I believe that we are working towards better and better models of encoding digitally the critical apparatus. Um, it's, not, it's not something that is there and there is no easy solution, I think, to be found. We have to work to develop good, good solutions. As for the subjectivity or objectivity of the critical apparatus, well, sometimes it is objective in, in the sense that if, if uh, you read the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H in a manuscript, then you can't write something quite different in a critical apparatus. But sometimes the sources, even the sources give leeway. So some manuscript readings are ambiguous. Um, some readings of the Codex Oxoniensis of Catullus, or which, which we saw at the beginning of my presentation, um, they can be interpreted in, in more than one way, legitimately. So, so um, there you either say that this reading is ambiguous or as an editor, you say, I read that. Um, there are some cases also in which, in which a manuscript is, is, is very, very difficult to read where different scholars might legitimately pick out a different reading from the, the blurred, faded or rubbed image. So, so I think that with texts, objectivity is quite a, quite a difficult, a, a more difficult concept than you would think. So, so um, I, I would argue that, that the, the idea of an objective and authoritative text, that's actually the product of the careful editing that uh, people in the 19th and especially the 20th century were used to and and you know medieval manuscripts are not carefully edited they are manuscripts first of all so they are irregular and and second they contain all sorts of oddities um, um, and the same applies in different ways to the scholarship that's that appears in a critical apparatus so um, I, I I think that it's of its uh, the material the material in an apparatus is of its essence, tricky and complex, and and we have to work hard to create a suitable digital equivalent. And Daniela has done wonderful work to to uh, provide the regularity as well as the flexibility required to um, mirror this in a digital uh, format. And I think that the the matter of scale is a different, a smaller smaller concerning comparison, whether you have a full scale repertory of conjectures as I have in Catullus online, or just a select, a select apparatus as in Musisque, Deuque. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, so you and uh, Daniele can read, uh, okay, the questions uh, on uh, the chat, okay. I, uh, I will uh, read them, but uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can also uh, read there, okay. So Samuel Husky uh, is asking you, the very impressive, uh, do new models have to be developed for each edition? or rather for each editor to cope with their individual ways of working? 
probably okay. this is a question okay. for Daniele, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, models uh, usually are developed just once and then reused. And that is the philosophy of the system is to build a set of components like a sort of gallery you can pick from and uh, build, uh, assemble your own uh, super model by just composing it uh, from uh, smaller pieces which are already available because uh, are already uh, being developed for, for other projects. So for instance, if you go on uh, in our repository at the VDAPH uh, GitHub, you will find that there is a number of different projects under the name Cadmus because there is uh, a number of projects using it for its own purposes. And most of them share a subset of models, uh, reusing them, but uh, each of them adds its own models because it uh, has different uh, purposes and uh, different perspectives. If you want to look for uh, uh, texts uh, and uh, manuscripts, apparatus, and so forth. OK, and then uh, uh, I thank you very much, uh, Bridget Almas, to be here with us. Uh, and Bridget uh, is uh, uh, one of the leaders, uh, okay, of the uh, and uh, uh, the uh, designer and developer of the Alfeios project, okay. And uh, she's uh, asking if Proteus and Cadmus uh, source, uh, yeah, if Proteus and Cadmus are open source and if they are available on on GitHub, okay. Cadmus uh, is already available on, on GitHub, has been developed from, has developed from the ground up uh, in GitHub uh, since last year. And uh, Proteus is not yet there because it was born uh, as a more commercial project. So I need to drop some licenses before having it on the public domain. But uh, you can find uh, not only the source, but also some uh, ready to use uh, Docker images uh, to be run yeah. on your own computer and play with the system. For Cadmus, yeah. For Cadmus. Uh, and then uh, Simone Zenzaro is uh, asking if in Daniele Fusi work, uh, how is a link created between the text parser and the resulting list of comments? <laughs> Okay, in this case, Does it uh, require, sorry, I, I continue, okay, uh, because it mm -hmm. is just one question. Uh, does it require a customer parser uh, to be written, uh, uh, customized for each project? Okay, uh, we are not going into a list of commands as our result because we are just using the parsers to build an object. So the parsers builds something which is then serialized into JSON. But anyway, usually the parsers are the most specific and specialized part in the pipeline so that different projects probably have to use different parsers for their own purposes. But uh, here too, we can probably reuse a good uh, number of uh, modules. It really depends uh, on the status uh, of our input and uh, from uh, the different types uh, of uh, typographic and semantic uh, ways uh, the text was encoded at first. Okay, uh, Jeff Love. Uh, is there a prototype of the front-end editor available anywhere for experimenting with uh, how it works before attempting to deploy all these locally? Okay. Uh, okay. By the way, thanks for all of the documentation in GitHub. <laughs> okay, uh, as I have just uh, said before, there are a number of Docker images you can download in your own computer and start to get a full stack uh, of okay. servers, uh, virtual servers, uh, and uh, just play with the system uh, with some predefined the data, mock data created by the system, and some predefined uh, user interfaces and models. Perfect. And Simone, again, which project in the VDPH GitHub repository should be the starting point to read about Cadmus and Proteus? Uh, for Proteus, you can go to the Catullus Online uh, Catutil, I suppose it's named, because are the tools we are using to convert uh, our Catullus Online edition. And uh, for Cadmus, uh, the documentation is completely centralized into a dedicated repository, which is named Cadmus Doc. 
but then each model has its own documentation. So if you can want, if you want to see some project which is more advanced than others, so you, you should probably look at uh, the Itinera Cadmus project, which has already a number of, uh, big number of models uh, in place and working like 50 or 40 models uh, for text, uh, code, code ecology, persons, letters, because there we, have, we are dealing with epistolography of Petrarch and his correspondence. Very good. And uh, Javier Velaza, uh, very interesting. Congratulations, one more step on. E tour in Novam Silvam. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, Samuel Husky uh, for Daniel Kiss. How has working with Daniele changed your approach to critical editing? Um, well, uh, thank you, Sam, for the question. Um, I, uh, it has made me reflect on, on some of the practical and especially the theoretical sides of, of uh, textual criticism, um, because, you know, IT comes down to data and how you, how you structure data, but also the nature of data. You have to optimize um, in relationship to um, in view of the essence of the data, and and Daniela uh, and I share the aim of creating an optimal, an ideal digital, well, or as good as humanly possible digital structure for for digital editions. So not just something that happens to work, but something that's really appropriate to the essence of of this kind of content. And another thing that I'm very interested in is media change and how how um, um, this process of developing digital editions and di di digital critical editions um, works. And um, so someone has asked before, it might have been you, Sam, um, um, whether this model can be reused, but I, I'm also interested in whether the concepts can be reused. And one concept that I really, really like about Daniela's work and about Musisque de Uc is that it's a non-hierarchical model of text. So you can simply and easily replace one reading by another, um, and and incidentally, you might remember the slide on which um, there is a, a a special feature: is this reading accepted by the editor or not? It's a very simple way to to uh, reflect digitally the essence of philological processes. Thank you, and uh, thank you to Paolo for uh, the links. And uh, Franz uh, Fischer has uh, two questions. Yeah. Uh, so please, yeah. Franz. Yeah, thank, thank you for this crazy ride. So that was really a lot of input. I mean, I know the project, uh, but uh, this was still a very, very tough. So thank you very much. It's really impressive work you are doing. So I have two questions I should have asked also earlier. But uh, so, um, so one question is regarding the completeness or the the, uh, the criteria or arbitrariness of your choice. So you follow, um, uh, Daniel, you, you, for, uh, you follow a um, uh, maximalist approach. So you, you um, collect all the variants and uh, um, um, uh, suggestions of um, um, previous editors or from the, at least from the four main manuscripts or also from 120 other manuscripts. So how complete is this data? And so, I mean, as a, an indication could be uh, in how far is it possible to recreate versions of a certain manuscript or a, a certain author, uh, editor. So that would be uh, uh, one question uh, um, as regards the completeness of your, your data, because that would be a, a very important uh, uh, quality of this collection of data. And the other uh, question, so, I mean, you have all this beautiful information, uh, um, the maximal amount of uh, uh, um, information available or that you found in all these uh, uh, comments and editions and, uh, uh, and um, um, articles. Um, uh, but uh, in a way, this is dead. The data is dead. It's, I mean, it's, uh, you, you then have a choice as the editor. That's my reading. So that's my lemma. I make this a lemma. I, I uh, raise this uh, into the, 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 the um, heaven or into the, the, the canonical version. And uh, the rest is then in the, in the critical apparatus. 
uh, but we have no indication. Uh, so, I mean, what, what I really uh, find is fantastic, your uh, Catullus seminars. So when you uh, bring to life the voices of these editors and, and authors and of Catullus, of course, because you want to understand what has Catullus uh, actually had in mind and what did he want to say. And you bring to life all these voices discussing all these issues. And then you have lots of arguments and, and points in favor or um, uh, uh, um, uh, against uh, certain readings, but this information is hidden, so it's not not uh, available as data. So we can learn nothing about this. And when when uh, you are gone, everything is gone. We only have the the, the dead uh, data, so variants, but without any indication. So is there something at least that points into the direction? So the the order, I, I mean, of of entries, or uh, so the the way. Uh, or do you see a way or possibility to formalize your your critical input? Because that's I mean that's the the the, the task of the of the editor then to have a critical evaluation of readings and then then to make choices and decisions. But this information is not explicit. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a pity. So. Uh, th thank you very much, Franz. Uh, th those are important questions. So as for the completeness of Catullus Online, um, um, there is a page, well, Catullus Online is currently working, perhaps I should have, I should have said so, so it's currently working on um, and available freely online um, in its original rather basic format. And there you have a, an account of the criteria of admission. So um, it's not only a critical ed edition, but also a repertory of conjectures, which means that I seek to present all the conjectures on Catullus that have ever been presented in print. So if Scali Germ has made 129 conjectures, then all 129 should be there. If you publish tomorrow a conjecture on Catullus in print or in a, a, in a similar digital format, then it will appear there. Um, peer reviewed is actually the criterion that I used. And of non-living scholars, so scholars who are not, no longer alive, um, manuscript material is included by a generous criterion. So if they make a, make a conjecture, it's included probably normally, but I don't want to encourage living scholars to publish there because I think that conjectures, textual proposals should go through peer review. So um, many, many proposals are made, but they turn out to be just impossible. And I don't want to have to include to clog my notes with those. So there are criteria for admission and um, um, basically printed scholarly, the, the essence is that scholarly publications are included, but it's only included, I only mention where the reading is first used. So I think Scaliger's conjecture um, uh, on at Catullus uh, 61b line 41 is accepted by 95% of editors since then, or or even more. But but you know, um, um, there was no space, and there was no space to write that 95% of editors have have accepted this or to list them. It would have been an even more enormous work than it already was to compile the data. And a similar story applies a slightly different one to the manuscripts, the Renaissance manuscripts that have no source value. So um, I included material quite generously from there, some readings that perhaps someone with a lot of goodwill could consider plausible. And of course, all plausible readings, all readings that appear in inferior manuscripts that might be good ideas, but um, but but not the full readings. So not all the mistakes, not all the all the uh, spelling mistakes, or not all the spelling variants, all the gaps in the text, and all that. So you cannot reconstruct the inferior manuscripts. You cannot reconstruct the scholarly editions from Catullus Online. What you can reconstruct is the source source manuscripts, and this is, as you know, standard standard procedure in critical editions. But in in some distant future, we could aim for completeness. Um, and as for the other the other your other question about the arguments, um, so yes. Um, f uh, thoughts, so judgments, critical judgments are at the heart of the decisions um, of a critical editor. Um, and there is 
certainly something to be said, as you as you pointed out, in favor of adding a section of comments or editorial comments or editorial explanations to such a publication. There is there is there is a lot to be said in favor of such an approach. And there's a question by Chiara Martignano. I really appreciated your presentation. Thank you. I was wondering whether you designed the critical apparatus model from scratch or if it is based on some other model. Okay. Uh, I start from a sketch draft, but uh, it was designed to cope with existing models. Um, first of all, TI. Also because, uh, as you have seen, M Musisco de Oque is using TI as an exchange format yeah. and yeah. Cadmus uh, was to be used as the editing system for that project. And also any other project adopting Cadmus, including Catullus Online, of course, brought its contribution to this model. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and then, uh, okay, uh, some uh, congratulations from uh, Linda, Ricardo and Bridget. And then, uh, uh, Michael Henry, uh, to clarify, when you find an impossible published conjecture on Catullus, do you include it with uh, e.g. contra metrum or exclude it or include it without warning? Uh, this is a question for Daniel, I guess. Well, uh, I... I... Um, then I try to apply the criteria of admission automat automatically. So even if it's a terrible conjecture, um, I put it in because it's a repertory of conjectures. And I think that I have written mire quidem. So uh, surprisingly indeed, amazingly indeed, somewhere in the apparatus. But generally, I've tried to be very, very reserved about expressing judgment. You know, um, the data is there and it's the task of the reader, the user to select from all that data, or indeed of the computer program, if we will one day get an editing an editing pro pro program that can edit classical Latin poetry, but we are not quite there yet. Okay, thank you for Daniele Fusi. Uh, uh, for Daniele Fusi. Uh, does the translation to TI retains all the information in Cadmus? Okay, uh, that's a good question. That is because uh, Cadmus uh, is uh, virtually unlimited and open. So in theory, it's a supper set of, of what can be encoded in TI. But uh, as for a critical text, uh, probably we can be confident to be able to build a standoff TI output, at least for what is traditionally known as a critical edition. So witnesses and uh, authors and variants and comments and the like. Of course, uh, it will be always a matter of selecting the material from a more structured and uh, a potentially wider uh, database uh, to fit uh, the the scope of the export, but uh, that's the, the philosophy of the, of the project, to be able to encode uh, in a structured format whatever content we want, not even uh, textual in some cases, but then be able to provide uh, the output which we expect, uh, like TI, which is of course standard and uh, everyone is using it. Perfect. So this time, just for a last question, if somebody wants to ask something. Well, yes, uh, may I, Ricardo here? Yeah, of course, thank you. Well, my question is uh, simple. I mean, I've been um, I, I signed in for listening to your presentation because I'm involved in the edition of Immanuel Kant. And I, I wanted to ask you, did this year of uh, seclusion change your habits? Because uh, in my case, uh, I used to go to Rome, uh, to the Villa Mirafiori, open books uh, and have a meeting on the table with a group. And then it was impossible because the Villa Mirafiori, which is the Institute of Philosophy in Rome, was shut. So we had to work together online. Are you doing that too? First question. Second question, how open are you? 
because um, one of the interesting things of this year of lockdown is that um, groups uh, have been working more intensely together. Mm -hmm. And the question is how open? Uh, so uh, will you be willing to let people in uh, in, in some of your sessions? Uh, that's something you are considering? Thank you. Well, if I may, so, so we are actually working internationally. I am now physically in Budapest, Hungary, and Daniela is, I believe, in Rome. Um, and and we, have, we have conducted this whole project online over Zoom, over Google Meet, by email. Uh, and we find that it works reasonably well. I think sometimes it would be better to, to physically meet, but one can go quite a long way. Um, and as for being open, well, um, you know, it's an intense collaboration and what you do as step 29 doesn't make sense, much sense for someone who hasn't seen steps 1 to 28. So in this case, um, in this case, it would probably be a challenge to involve other people, but, but um, the Venice Center, Center for Digital and Public Humanities is, is very open in terms of involving other people. So, so um, um, I, I, I was based until the spring in at Utrecht University in Hungary, and I'm now based in Barcelona. And and um, Daniela Bez was was based at various places in Italy. But it, the the center does a great job of pulling people in from from the outside. That's that's a goal, I think. I mean, Franz Fischer is the director, so he he has the say in this, I suppose. But um, it, it's a strength. Of it. Thank you. Uh, Daniele, do you want to add something? Oh, no, I think Daniel has told uh, everything. Uh, we are, of course, uh, open because these are projects which are uh, much more powerful when they get uh, to be teamwork and network to other projects. Okay, so thank you very much to everybody. Thank you to Daniel and Daniele and uh, see you in January, okay? Uh, 11th of January, okay, uh, for uh, the next uh, uh, for the next webinar in our series. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. See you.